In our previous tutorial, we looked at how to simulate Class A amplifiers. In this tutorial, we will be looking at a more efficient uh, type of amplifier with a slightly more complex topology, uh, the Class B amplifier. In this case, uh, we don't have just one transistor, but we have two transistors of a slightly different type. So we have a, an NPN BJT, as we did with a Class A amplifier, but also a PNP BJT. And we combine these together to obtain an amplifier configuration which is more efficient. So the first thing that we need to do is to import the, the device models for the transistors that we will be using. In order to do so, we simply right-click on Netlist, go on to Import Netlist, and then we select the text file which is available on Blackboard for our NPN transistor, click on Open, then select HSPICE files obsolete, remember you need to pick the obsolete option, click on OK, and then when the simulator asks us if we want to reorder the nodes, then we should say yes, so that this makes it easier for us to then assign the appropriate symbol to the transistor later on. So click on yes here, you've got this transistor imported as you can see, and now we would right-click on that list yet again and go on to import that list, and this time we'll import a PNP transistor, which is the ZTX751 file shown here. Again, this is a simple text file available on Blackboard. Click on open, and then again select HSPICE obsolete, click on OK, and again allow the simulator to reorder the nodes as it sees fit. Now we've got our two transistor model imported, we have to verify them, and we do so by plotting the IV curves. I will do this for both transistors, although we've already done the NPN, because I would like to show you the difference between the two, and so I need to have both measurements set up in order to be able to compare them properly. So let's go on to circuit schematics, right click, and create a new schematic and we call this IV Curves NPN, and then we maximize the schematic, and we simply press Ctrl K to simply fetch the model of the transistor that we're interested in. In this case, it's the ZTX651, the NPN one. Double click, place on the schematic like so, then right click, go on to Properties, select the Symbol tab, and then select PJT3 at System as the symbol. Click on OK, and you can see now that your symbol is correct and the nodes are labeled appropriately. Now what we need to do is uh, fetch an IV curve tracer. We do that by pressing Ctrl L, typing in IV curve I. We place this on the schematic like so, and we connect the step terminal to the base and the swap terminal to the collector. Then we ground the emitter. The last thing left to do is to simply select a range for this IV curve tracing. We started from zero last time, we went up to 12 volts in steps of 0.1 volts, so we'll keep this consistent. Also, in terms of bias current, we started with zero milliamps, went up to uh, 500 microamps in steps of 100 microamps. So this is all set up uh, for us now. All we need to do is simply go onto graphs, right click, create a new graph. We will call this IV characteristic NPN. And then we simply right click on the graph, select add a new measurement. We'll have to go on to the nonlinear measurements and then select current. And from the list, select IV curve, select the schematic from which our measurement will come, which is only one at the moment, IV curves NPN, that's correct. And keep everything else the same. Click on apply and then OK. Then simulate. And there we have it. We have exactly the same IV curve as we did in the previous video. And this is what we expect, of course. Now we need to have a look at the IV curves for the PNP transistor. This is a bit trickier than it may sound. You have to know how the transistor operates, really, so that you can set up the IV curves correctly. So the first thing that I will do is simply uh, duplicate the schematic that we've got at the moment. To do so, I can simply right-click on it and select Duplicate. Or, as you know, I can simply grab the schematic and drag it onto the circuit schematic headings and this creates a copy. I will then rename this one and I will call it IV Curves PNP. Now I will zoom out a little bit here, so I make a little bit of space for myself. Then I press Ctrl K and this time I'm going to fetch the model for the PNP transistor. Double click on that, place it on the schematic, right click, select properties and then go on to the symbol tab. And in this case you will have to select BJT3 PNP so that your pins are labelled correctly. Click on OK, and now you've got your PNP transistor on your schematic. Now, there are differences, of course, between NPN and PNP transistors. I won't go through all of them, but there are two in particular that we have to be aware of in order to be able to set up our IV measurement correctly. Firstly, the direction of current flow. In the case of an NPN transistor, 
A current flows between the collector and the emitter terminal. So the current flows from the collector terminal down to the emitter. And this indeed ties in with the symbolic representation of the NPN transistor, which has an arrow placed uh, like so uh, to indicate the direction of current flow. In order for current to flow in this direction, of course we have to have the collector at a higher potential than the emitter. In this case, this condition is satisfied because our emitter is grounded and our collector will be swept through positive voltages from 0 up to 12 volts. Now, when it comes to the PMP transistor, the direction of current flow is reversed. So the current flows from the emitter terminal up to the collector terminal. And this is also shown by the uh, symbol of the transistor, which has an arrow which indicates that the direction of current flow is from the emitter terminal to the collector terminal. But in order for current to flow in this direction, we have to have uh, the uh, collector terminal at a lower potential than the emitter terminal. So we can't connect things up the same way as we did up here, because if we put this transistor up here and then we connected it in this fashion, then the emitter would be at a lower potential than the collector all the time. And this means that the current couldn't possibly flow from the emitter to the collector terminal. The easiest way to sort out this problem is simply to flip the transistor upside down and then to ground the bottom terminal. And that way the current should be able to flow in the direction in which it is intended to flow. To flip the transistor we simply right click on it and then select flip then we draw the axis about which we want to flip it, like so. And you can see that now we've got the emitter at the top and the collector at the bottom. Now, if I ground the collector, like so, uh, and if I connected uh, the IV curve tracer as we have here, then I would have the emitter at a higher potential than the collector all the time, and hence uh, the current could flow from the emitter to the collector terminals. So, let's simply copy the IV curve tracer that we've got here, click on it, press Ctrl C, then press Ctrl V and place it on the schematic like so. Then connect the swept terminal to the emitter terminal of the PNP transistor. And this accounts for one of the differences between the way that NPN and PMP transistors operate. The next one is not quite as easy to understand and it may be slightly mind-boggling for you. I will try to make it as easy as possible but at the end of the day you just have to get your head around it I guess or just accept it. What makes things a little bit more difficult is that we use the conventional current flow. Remember that conventional current is defined as the flow of positive charges, although in actual facts it is the electrons that move. But of course this is a widely used convention that is the standard in our circuit analysis and also in the simulator. In the case of the NPN transistor we assigned a range of positive values to our bias current which was our base current and this meant that we injected a positive current, a current made up of positive carriers, into the base. So in the case of the NPN transistor we can see our bias current as a current made up of holes uh, which uh, are positive of course and these positive carriers get into the base of uh, our transistor and the effect that they have is to lower the barrier, the voltage barrier which is built in, into the PN junction thus allowing current to flow. So in a transistor much as you have in a diode you have a PN junction between the base and the emitter terminal. This PN junction will have a built-in voltage in there which is created by fixed lattice charges. When we get uh, lots of positive charges into the base of the transistor these will compensate the negative lattice charges which are creating a barrier between the base and the emitter terminals and once you have a sufficient bias current so a sufficient number of carriers to lower your voltage barrier at the PN junction then current can flow. In the case of a PNP transistor we have a similar situation but our PN junction is flipped upside down so instead of uh, needing positive carriers to be injected into the base to lower the voltage barrier as we did in the NPN case, we need negative carriers to be uh, injected into the base in order to lower the voltage barrier between the emitter and the base terminal and allow current to flow. So we need to have negative carriers to flow 
into the base, but of course the current in this simulator is defined as the flow of positive charges. So how do we set up a current which is made up of negative charges? Now here is the trick. You can think of a current made up of negative charges that goes in one direction as a current of equal magnitude made up by positive charges but flowing in the opposite direction. So we can think of drawing holes out of the base of the transistor which then will leave electrons behind and hence uh, do the trick that we want. The electrons which are left into the base when the holes flow out of it will be able to counterbalance the positive lattice charges on the base side of the p-n junction and hence allow the built-in field to decrease and the current to flow between the emitter and the collector terminal. So all we need to do having said all that is set up a current which is negative. So we are assuming that we can represent a current made up of negative charges as a current in the opposite direction made up of positive charges. What this boils down to is the fact that our starting current will be something like minus 0.5 milliamps, our final current will be something like 0 milliamps and again we go in steps of 0.1 milliamps. Having said all that we can then simply get rid of this bit because I only left it in there so that we could uh, carry out the comparison quite easily between the two uh, and then I can zoom in a little bit and the next thing of course is to set up an IV curve graph so that we can see uh, how the PMP differs from the MPN. So to this end we can simply go to graphs and we can duplicate the, the graph that we got at the moment for the NPN. Uh, we'll then uh, rename it of course so as to avoid confusion and we'll call it PNP and then we we'll right click on the graph go on to modify measurement and we change the data source name to IV Curves PMP and click on OK and simulate. And now you can see that our IV curves seem to be working correctly and you may wonder why they look so very similar uh, to uh, the ones that we had for the NPN. So let me close all the windows here and then just reopen these two graphs. Then I can simply tile them vertically so we can see them side to side. Now although they look very similar the main difference between these two is the fact that in the case of the PNP transistor shown on the left hand side the voltage that you see here on the x-axis is VEC so the voltage between the emitter and the collector whereas in the case of the NPN transistor the voltage that we've got on the x-axis is VCE the voltage between the collector and the emitter terminals. And also bear in mind that although both the current for the PNP transistor and the current for the NPN transistor appear to be positive, they're actually flowing in opposite directions. To make this a little bit clearer, what we can do is go back to our PNP measurement. And now what we'll do is uh, flip the transistor upside down. So I'll just remove the connections here and then right click on the transistor and select flip. Flip it upside down so we have it exactly in the same way as we had our NPN transistor. Then I'll reconnect everything together. Now because we need the collector to be at a lower voltage than the emitter in order for current to flow uh, in uh, this transistor we need to change the voltage range through which we sweep the collector terminal to a negative one. Uh, so we simply uh, select a starting voltage to, to be minus 12 and a final voltage to be zero and we keep the step the same. This way our emitter is grounded, our collector is swept through a negative range and hence we still have the correct voltage uh, to be able to get the current to flow from the emitter to the collector terminal. The advantage of having this configuration is that now on the IV curves we have exactly the same quantity on the x-axis. The voltage is in the same polarity so we can see a direct comparison between uh, the, the two IV curves. So if I click on simulate and then I have a look at the IV characteristic for the PNP transistor you can see that now the current is got a negative sign to indicate that it flows in an opposite direction to the one that we saw for the NPN transistor and of course the voltage as well now it's VCE and is of course a negative one. In fact we could even see a direct comparison between these two IV curves by simply clicking on the measurement for the PMP IV curves and dragging it onto the IV characteristic for the NPN. Now if we look at this graph you can see that we can see both uh, on the same graph. So this clearly shows two things that uh, the polarity of the voltage that you have to apply across the uh, emitter and collector terminals 
for PNP and NPN transistors is opposite and also that the current flows in opposite directions. In one case from the collector to the emitter for the NPN and in the other case from the emitter to the collector for the PNP. So now let's move on to setting up a simulation which will allow us to analyze a class B amplifier stage. First of all let's remove all we've done uh, for the IV curves because the only thing that we actually need to keep is the imported models. So I'll just delete all the schematics and the graphs. Now let's go on to circuit schematics and open a new schematic and we'll call it class B amplifier. And then as we did previously we press Control K to fetch the models for our transistors. Let's start with the NPN one. We simply place it on the schematic and then we right click and go and assign a symbol to it which will allow us to recognize the uh, terminals easily. And then we do the, exactly the same thing for the PMP transistor. Press Ctrl K and then fetch the right model. Right click, go on to properties and assign the correct symbol to it. Now you can see that if we connected the emitter of the NPN transistor to the collector of the PMP transistor, current will be flowing in opposite directions along the same branch. And of course we can't have that. We must have a current which flows consistently uh, in the same direction for both transistors. So in order to uh, make this happen, uh, you can see it on the schematic in figure 4.2 of your handout, the PMP transistor is flipped upside down. So simply right click and go on to flip, draw the axis about which you want to flip, and then you've got uh, the two transistors in a configuration where both emitters can be connected together and then the current can flow consistently through the two transistors, as indicated by the two arrows in their symbols. Now let's zoom out a little bit to get a bit more space and uh, we'll then set up the BIOS network for the transistors. To do so we simply press Ctrl L and type in RES to fetch a few resistors. Right click to rotate, place on the schematic and then press Ctrl C and Ctrl V to create four copies. Now let's uh, move the transistors a little bit so we can uh, get them in alignment uh, with the nodes that we need to connect them to and connect things as is shown in the schematic in section 4.2. Notice that in uh, the handout there is an ammeter in a series with the collector of the PMP transistor which is the bottom one. But uh, as you've seen with Macro Office when we carry out DC measurements we don't need any measurement component. We can simply use annotations. So we won't include an, an ammeter in this case. And then of course we need a ground reference and a power supply. Uh, to get the power supply press Ctrl L and then type in DCVS and then place it on the schematic like so. Of course you need a ground reference for it as well and then we can connect it to the collector of the NPN transistor and one of the bias resistors at the top. Now let's click on view all to see things a bit more closely and then let's uh, type in the values for the various bias resistors which are given to you. In this case we've got uh, values in kilo ohms, uh, we can change the units uh, from the project options or we can simply type in 27k for instance to achieve a resistance of 27 kilo ohms. I'll do just that in this case. So I'll type in 27k uh, and then uh, 2.7k down here and I'll do the same for the other two. Now we are given a range uh, for the value of our DC voltage source and of course we can uh, set a range by simply making the value of the voltage uh, provided by the voltage source tunable and then clicking on the tune tool and setting the minimum maximum step this way. But there is also another way and I'll show you that this time uh, so that you know how to do it in future. Simply double click on the element and then go on to the parameters tab and then you can set a nominal value, let's say 12 volts and then you can see that the tune box is already ticked and what you can do is also set limits for your tuning. So simply click on the limit box and then set a lower value of 11 volts, an upper value of 15 volts and a step of 0.1 and then click on OK. Now when you open the tuner you can see that these values have been set already. Now you are asked to look at the bias current and see how this varies as you change the supply voltage. In order to do this, of course, all we need to do is simply add annotations to our circuit. So we right click on the circuit schematic, go on to add annotation and then we'll add the current of course and also I will add the voltage for every node. Now if I simulate, I should see this information on the schematic.
Note that sometimes, although you've added uh, more than one annotation, you can only uh, see one for each node. And this may be to do with the fact that one is hidden under the other. So you simply move one away and then uh, you often uh, get uh, to see what was hidden underneath. So we can do this for these various resistors so we can see all the voltages uh, at every node. Now we can open the Tune tool and we can simply see how varying the DC supply voltage changes the bias current of the transistor. So we can see that when we've got uh, about 11 volts, the bias current into the base is really quite small, is of the order of 0.3 microamps, and proportionally the emitter and collector currents are small as well. Then as we increase the bias voltage, you can see that we get more current injected into the base, and hence we get more current through the collectors and the emitters of the transistors. Now, the other thing that would be interesting to see would be the base emitter and emitter base voltages. Now, there is more than one way to carry this out. We can use a voltage meter to see the voltage uh, difference between two nodes. So I'll just close the tuner here and uh, make myself a little bit of space. And then what I can do is simply press Ctrl L and then type in V underscore meter. And then I'll place uh, one meter right here to measure the base emitter voltage of the NPN transistor. Let's change the IG to reflect this. and We'll call this VBE. And then we make a copy of this one here and we place another meter like so. And this one instead will be measuring the emitter base voltage for the PMP transistor. So we'll call this one VEB. As we've seen before, to see the DC voltage that a meter is measuring, we need to add an extra annotation. So we'll go back to circuit schematics and right click on the name of our schematic, go on to add annotation and add DCAM, click on apply and then OK. And now when we simulate, uh, we can actually see the meter readings for both the uh, base emitter voltage of the NPN transistor and the emitter base voltage of the PNP. And if we open the tuner yet again, as we tune the DC supply voltage through the range that we've set, we can also see that the uh, bias current that we get is proportional to the base emitter and emitter base voltages. Although this approach is actually fine for a circuit of this size, uh, when the circuit is a lot more complex, inserting meters all over the place is not exactly an elegant or an easy solution. So I'll show you a different way uh, to do this. Although it's not necessary to use it in this particular case, I think it'll be useful to you uh, for future work that you do on the simulator. So uh, I'll just close the tuner here and uh, get rid of these two meters, and then I will make things a little bit more compact. So to carry out the measurement between two nodes, we will be using measurement probes and output equations. Uh, the measurement probes, or M probes for short, uh, can be found on the toolbar up here. So I'll just click on one and then uh, right click to rotate it and simply place it at the base terminal of the NPN transistor. And then I'll call it uh, VB1. Then I can simply click on it, press Ctrl C, Ctrl V to create a copy and place a second probe uh, on the uh, base terminal of the PMP transistor, and we'll call that VB2. Then I can simply press Ctrl V again to create a third instance, uh, right click to rotate, and I'll place another probe at the emitter terminal uh, of the NPN and PMP transistors. As you can see that the emitters for both uh, PMP and NPN are connected together. Now uh, we'll go on to output equations, and we simply right click and click on new output equations. We'll give it a name, uh, let's call it uh, voltages. What output equations allow you to do is to get the numerical results that you would normally plot in a graph uh, into a variable. To do this, uh, we simply click on uh, output equation up in the toolbar here. And once you click on that, uh, a dialog uh, box comes up, which is very, very similar to what you would get when you add a new measurement to a graph. The only difference is that you have to specify a variable name. For your graph, the output is the graph. For an output equation, the output will be whatever variable you assign it to. So let's start with the uh, base voltage of the NPN transistor. We'll call that VB1. And then we have to go on to nonlinear, and we'll have to go on to voltage, select VDC, and then uh, the schematic from which it comes from, class B amplifier. And of course, we need to find uh, the probe from which we'll get this voltage. So we'll just click on the three dots, click on the right probe, and then on OK. And then click on OK again. Now you have this box floating about, simply click anywhere on this canvas, and you can see that uh, the variable VB1 has been created, 
whose value is the uh, measured voltage, which is measured by probe VB1. Now, uh, to create new variables, we can simply, again, copy and paste this one and change a few things. So click on it, press Ctrl C, then Ctrl V, and then right click, select properties, change the name of the variable to VB2, select a different probe for the measurement, VB2, which is the base of the PMP transistor, and then click on OK. And again, press Ctrl V, and then uh, we can right click, go into properties, and we want the emitter voltage, and this, of course, will come from M-probe VE. Click on OK. And now you've got three variables in which every time you simulate the value of the base voltage for the MPN transistor, the value of the base voltage for the PMP transistor, and the value of the emitter voltage for both transistors will be stored. Now, of course, however, we don't want these voltages just like that, because those we could have obtained easily by using annotation. We want to manipulate them so that we can obtain the difference between uh, some of these voltages. To do this, you simply click on the equation icon up in the toolbar, and then uh, you set up an equation uh, right here. And we'll call the first one, for instance, VB1E. And uh, this will be the voltage between the base of the NPN transistor and uh, the emitter. And we'll simply say VB1E equals to VB1 minus VE. Notice that this is not an output equation. This is a simple equation which uses two output equations, VB1 and VE, to calculate the voltage across the base emitter junction of the NPN transistor. Then we can do a similar thing for the PMP transistor. Simply click on this equation, press Ctrl C, Ctrl V, and then place another one right under it. And we simply need to change a couple of things. We'll call this VB2E. And then, of course, this will be using a different output equations, VB2, to do the calculation. Now, lastly, there is another very interesting thing that you can do uh, when it comes to both equations and output equations, and that is display their value on the canvas. To do this, uh, you simply uh, click on equation, and then you type in the name of the variable that you want to display, let's say VB1, and then you use a colon just after it. And this means that every time you simulate, you will see the value of this variable displayed on the canvas. This is very useful because, of course, with output equations, you don't get uh, the output on a graph. And so you may want to know what the output equations are so that if you see some funny results, uh, you know where they've come from. So again, I've just pressed Control c and Control v and create a few more. So I'd like to see VB2 as well. And then I'd like to see VE as well. And we can do this also for uh, the equations, not just for the output equations. So I'll just click on this one, for instance, press Ctrl C, then Ctrl V, and then remove everything on the right hand side of the equal and replace it with a colon. I'll do the same for the other one. Now, if I hit simulate, you can see that I can not only store the values in the variables, but also see them. And I have successfully been able to use the output equations in and normal equations to calculate the difference between the voltages at different nodes. Now, if I open the tuner, again, as you tune your value for your DC source, you can see how uh, the various values change, and you can see it in real time and directly on the canvas. Notice that in uh, this case, I've uh, used uh, the same uh, polarity to measure the voltages across each base emitter junction, just to show you that the two are actually opposite in, in polarity. However, you could easily change uh, the equation for the PMP transistor to display VEB rather than VBE. Simply rename this variable VEB2, and then uh, you simply reverse the equation. Now, if you simulate, you'll see that uh, the voltage in this case is, of course, uh, positive for both because we are measuring them with opposite polarities. So now that we've looked at the various biasing aspects of our transistor, we need to uh, utilize an AC signal at the input to be able to characterize the behavior of the amplifier. First of all, uh, what I'll do is get rid of a lot of stuff that we don't need anymore. Uh, we'll get rid of the output equations canvas. Uh, we won't need these. And then also I'll get rid of all the annotations because, again, they just decrease legibility. Uh, let's close the tuner and also get rid of these probes, which we won't need. So far, we've not included the uh, capacitors and the load resistor, which are shown on this schematic in figure 7 of section 4.2. But of course, when we use an AC signal, we'll need those so that our input signal does not affect our bias. So let's just press Ctrl-L and fetch a couple of capacitors. 
and uh, we know that we've got to use 10 microfarads. The units are correct. Let's put 10 in there. Control C, Control V, and put this on the other side as well. Then we can get ourselves a load resistor. We can simply click on one of these, press Control C, Control V, and then uh, place it at the output like so. We'll of course have to change the ID to RL, and then we change the value as well to 100 ohms. We need to get a ground reference and then we'll connect it to the capacitor like so. Now we need to have an uh, input voltage source and we get that by pressing Ctrl L and typing in ACVS and then we'll place that at the input like so. We get a ground connection as well and then we connect it to the capacitor. The handout uh, stipulates that we should have a 1 volt peak signal and you know that MAG in microwave office indicates the peak amplitude of the signal so in terms of magnitude we are fine in terms of the frequency of course you know that this is set globally in microwave office and hence let's just go to project options double click and then select the frequency units to be kilohertz uh, the frequency itself to be three kilohertz uh, select single point and apply the other thing that we're asked to do is to sweep our voltage source from 5 volts upwards. So we simply double click on this and then we choose a nominal value of 5 volts and a lower boundary of course of 5 volts as well and then click on OK. And this will allow us to tune it according to what the handouts is asking us. I'd like to put another couple of things on the schematic uh, because these will help us understand what's going on. So first of all, I'm going to make a little bit of space at the output here. And I'd like to be able to measure the output voltage, which is the voltage across the load resistor, RL. To do that, I will be lazy and use a measurement probe uh, just to avoid clogging the schematic with lots of uh, voltmeters. I'll uh, give this an ID of VL, so it's easily recognizable. And then I will remove this connection and I will get myself a current meter, I underscore meter, and then place it in series like that. I'll uh, change the ID of this one to IL. Last but not least, I want to be able to measure the uh, voltages across the base emitter junctions for both transistors. So I'll get myself a little bit of space here and get myself a couple of voltage meters in the case of a PMP transistor, we could use VEB or VBE, but if for consistency with your handout, and also uh, because it may help us understand things a little bit more clearly, I will uh, keep the polarity of the measurements identical. So I'll measure VBE both for the MPN and the PMP transistor. At the beginning of this video, we were looking at IV characteristics of MPN and PMP transistors. And we said that for an MPN transistor, we need to inject a positive current into the base in order for the transistor to turn on and conduct. In order to have current flowing from the base to the emitter, we need to have the base at higher potential than the emitter. So VBE must be positive in order for the transistor to turn on. But how much current do we need to inject? It has to be a high enough current so that it can lower the voltage barrier created at the PN junction between base and emitter sufficiently as to allow current to flow. Now, this is to say that we have to have a high enough voltage across the base and emitter junction so that a high enough current can flow. The base emitter junction can be seen more or less like a diode, what we saw in Electronics 1. So we need to have a VBE voltage which is greater than about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 volts. If the voltage is below this threshold, the transistor will be off and hence there'll be no current conduction. For the PNP transistor, we saw the exact opposite. So what we wanted to do in this case is draw holes out of the base. So effectively have a positive current flowing out of the base. In order for this to happen, the voltage at this point has to be negative because I want to attract positive charges out of the base and in order for that to happen I have to have some negative charges here i.e. a negative potential. How negative a potential? It has to be negative enough to lower the voltage barrier at the PN junction formed between the emitter and the base sufficiently as to allow current to flow. So I have to have a sufficiently negative voltage between the base and the emitter in order for the PMP transistor to turn on. And this will have to be lower than something like minus 0.6 or minus 0.7 volts. Now, the voltage that we establish between our base emitter junctions 
is dependent on two factors. One is the bias network. So the bias network will, est will establish a fixed DC voltage both uh, at the base emitter junction of the NPN transistor and the base emitter junction of the PMP transistor. In the case of the NPN, this will be positive, and in the case of the PMP, this will be negative. Then, of course, we have our signal, and our signal will also affect the overall uh, VBE value for both transistors. Let's right-click on our Class B amplifier schematic and add an annotation for the voltmeters so we can see what our DC bias voltages are for the base emitter junctions. Click on Apply and then OK. Then Simulate. We can see that now we've got 0.23 volts for the uh, NPN and minus 0.23 volts for the PMP. So these transistors are not yet conducting. When the input signal comes in, the input signal will act as to increase these voltages between the base and emitter junctions and hence it may get the transistor to conduct if it's high enough. So let's take a look at what actually goes on. Let's right click on graphs, go on to new graph and then we'll call this waveforms and we right click, go on to add a new measurement and then select from the nonlinear uh, voltage and then V time and then uh, we'll simply select the measurement component as mprobe.vl so we want to see the output voltage click on apply and then we also want to see the input voltage click on the three dots click on your voltage source and then click on OK and apply and then OK again then simulate now here there are two major things to notice firstly the uh, input voltage and output voltage have got very different amplitudes so the input voltage is the pink curve and the output voltage is the blue curve. And the other thing is that the waveforms are quite different. When the input signal uh, has a relatively low value, uh, there is no output at all. And so also when it crosses the x-axis, you can also see that uh, there is uh, no output voltage at all. And this is called the crossover distortion. So when the signal crosses from being positive to negative, there is a window over which uh, there is no output signal, there is a flat bit and this obviously distorts the overall shape of the waveform and creates all sorts of problems. Now let's try to understand how this comes about. Before we do that though, let's go to project options and change our units so that they look a little bit better. Frequency in kilohertz and then time in milliseconds, click on OK and then simulate. Now the problem here uh, when there is crossover distortion and the reason why we don't have an output voltage is that we don't have any current flowing through our load. So it may be more useful to have the load current on this graph instead of the load voltage. So I'll simply right click, go on to modify measurement, I'll uh, pick on the output voltage, change that to a current and this would be I time. And of course we've got our meter which we've already set up and we'll have to set up like transient for the measurement and then click on OK and then simulate. Now the other two measurements that we may be interested in carrying out are the uh, base emitter voltages. So I'll simply right click, go on to add a new measurement and then I'll go back to the uh, voltages and V time. I will pick uh, the uh, VBE1 and choose apply transient yet again and click on apply and then I'll also pick uh, VBE2, click on OK and then apply and then simulate. The graph at the moment is a bit of a mess, so I'm going to try to make it a little bit more visible. Uh, we can use a second axis, a secondary axis, to be able to see things in a better way. To do that, right click on the graph, go on to options, and then go on to measurements, and select uh, your voltage measurements and associate them with the right axis, one by one. And then click on apply, and OK. Now I'll go to axis and right axis, and instead of having auto limits, I'll pick my own limits. And what we're going to do is choose traces. And then we get rid of the markers for this curve. And we'll make it a little bit thicker. And we'll make it uh, dotted as well. Click on apply. This looks clearer already, but now I'm going to use another trick up my sleeve. I want to look 
at the VBE measurements one at a time. To do that, simply uh, go on to the graph here and find your uh, VBE2 measurement. Right click and select Toggle Enable. And this has taken away the VBE measurement for the PMP transistor, which is fine. We can put it back on any time. Now, when we look at the VBE voltage for the NPN transistor, we first have to look at the point where the input signal is zero. When the input signal is zero, the only contribution that we have to the voltage between the base and emitter junction of the NPN transistor is that due to the bias network. And that's about 0.23 volts. This is not enough to make the transistor conduct because the PN junction between the base and the emitter at this voltage is still not forward biased. This is shown by the fact that the current is not actually flowing. There is no current flowing whatsoever. Now, as the input voltage increases, this is then added to the bias voltage of the bias network. And hence, the bias increases from its initial value to a point of about 0.6 volts, where the PN junction created by the base and the emitter of the NPN transistor is finally forward biased. Because it's forward biased, current starts to flow. So at this point here, we have enough voltage, enough VBE across the base emitter junction of the NPN transistor for current to flow. So the current starts to flow and follows, of course, the input voltage. The bigger the voltage, the bigger the current. And then as we start decreasing the input voltage, it gets to a point where the sum of the input voltage and the bias voltage again goes below the threshold for conduction. Our PN junction is no longer forward biased and hence what happens is that our current now stops flowing. So we've got something like that happening at the very beginning here when the input signal is ramping up and it's not yet got the base emitter voltage to a high enough level for conduction to occur. And also we've got this point here when the input voltage has now gone back down to a point where the sum of the bias voltage and the input voltage are not sufficient to keep the transistor conducting. As the input signal becomes negative, of course, then we have a negative voltage across the base emitter junction of the NPN transistor. And this, of course, means the transistor is turned off. If you have a PN junction and you put a negative voltage across it, all you're going to do is just increase its own built-in voltage and hence make it even harder for the device to conduct. Now, let's disable the measurement for VBE1 and enable the measurement for VBE2. Now we are looking at our PNP transistor. If we look at the PNP transistor and the base emitter voltage uh, for this device, we can see that when the input signal is positive, the base emitter voltage for the PNP transistor is also positive. And we've seen that in order for a PNP transistor to conduct, VBE must be negative and below a certain value. So if we put a positive voltage between the base and the emitter of a PMP transistor, the transistor will not conduct current. However, as our input signal becomes negative, then a negative voltage is added onto the negative bias voltage that we already had thanks to the bias network. So you remember that our bias network gave us a negative voltage, negative DC voltage between the base and emitter junction of the PMP transistor, which was about 0.23 volts. Now, as the input signal becomes more and more negative, this negative voltage adds to the negative bias voltage down to a point where we finally turn on the transistor. And hence, you can see that current starts to flow. As the input voltage becomes more and more negative, we continue uh, to increase the current which follows the input voltage but then it comes a point where our input voltage again becomes sufficiently positive as to not give a sufficient negative voltage across the base emitter junction of the PMP transistor and hence the transistor turns off again. Our current becomes zero and yet again we have this flat bit where there is no conduction. Of course when there is no current flowing there is no voltage either. Now how can we remedy this problem? Of course, the whole problem here is that the bias voltages that we have to begin with are not sufficiently high 
to uh, allow us to conduct for the entire cycle of the input signal. So what we can do is simply uh, tweak those DC bias voltages so as to have a sufficiently high DC bias so as to allow the transistor to conduct and amplify through the entire cycle of the input voltage. If we go back to a, a class B amplifier schematic we see that at the moment our bias voltages are quite low. We can increase the value of the DC voltage source here and this will also increase the bias voltages here. Now uh, let's go back to our waveforms graph and open the tuner and let's see what we can do to um, reduce the crossover distortion. If I increase the value of my DC voltage source I will increase the value of my base emitter junction bias and hence it will come a point where for the entire cycle of the input voltage I'm actually getting an output current. Now let's add our VBE1 again. You can see that uh, through the whole of the positive cycle of the input signal the voltage across the base and emitter junction is always higher than 0.55 which is enough to keep the transistor in conduction for the entire positive half of the input signal. Similarly when we look at the negative half of the input signal you can see that our voltage is always below minus uh, 0.55 volts and this is clearly enough to keep the transistor in conduction throughout the entire half of the negative going cycle of the input signal. Because now our output current follows the input voltage then also our load voltage should follow the input voltage without any crossover distortion. And we can verify this quite easily by simply right clicking, going on to add a new measurement and then we have a voltage, V time, we'll pick the uh, load voltage, click on apply and then OK and also we'll then associate this voltage with the right axis just to make sure that um, everything is consistent. And if we simulate you can see that also the load voltage now is uh, an entire waveform and, uh, and there is no crossover distortion. So the next thing that you're asked to do in section 4, 2, 3 is to insert a 10 ohm resistor in series with each collector. This is of course uh, the only way that you can measure your current in the lab because you're only able to use an oscilloscope which measures voltages. So you need to somewhat establish a voltage and you can do so by putting a resistor in series with each collector. In microwave office we don't need to do that and you can simply use current meters and I've put uh, two in here, one called IC1 for the uh, uh, NPN transistor and the other one called IC2 for the PNP transistor. So now we can go on to graphs and open a new graph, we'll call that uh, currents and then what we can do is simply add a new measurement and we'll go on to current, I time of course uh, and then we'll pick one of the current meters, the NPN and then click on apply and then we'll pick the one for the PMP and then again click on apply and then for completeness we'll put in the load current as well. So you can see how the uh, two currents combine into the uh, load resistor. So now if we simulate you can see that uh, we've got uh, the NPN transistor which only produces current during the positive going cycle of the input voltage and the PNP transistor which only produces current uh, during the negative going cycle of the input voltage. However the circuit topology is such that the two combine in such a way uh, as to have a continuous current uh, through the load. The other important point to notice is that uh, you can see that when the current uh, through the NPN transistor starts to decrease before it reaches zero the current through the PNP transistor starts to ramp up. We can change the thickness of the load current waveform so that we can see it a little bit more clearly and see that it is indeed continuous. However if we then uh, decreased the bias voltage yet again then we would see a very different scenario. Now you can see that the current through the NPN transistor 
goes down to zero way before the current through the PNP transistor ramps up. And so there is a, a time when there is no current flowing and this creates the crossover distortion.